This episode is sponsored by Dr. Chrono by EverHealth, the first and most advanced all-in-one mobile EHR system. With streamlined workflows, quick automations, and cutting-edge technology, Dr. Chrono by EverHealth allows you to maximize your practice wherever you go. To learn more about why so many other primary care practices love Dr. Chrono and to start your free trial, visit drchrono.com forward slash free trial. That's D-R-C-H-R-O-N-O dot com forward slash free trial. Direct Primary Care is an innovative alternative path to insurance-driven health care. Typically, a patient pays their doctor a low monthly membership and, in return, builds a lasting relationship with their doctor and has their doctor available at their fingertips. Welcome to the My DPC Story podcast, where each week you will hear the ever so relatable stories shared by physicians who have chosen to practice medicine in their individual communities through the direct primary care model. I'm your host, Marielle Conception, family physician, DPC owner, and former fee-for-service doctor. I hope you enjoy today's episode and come away feeling inspired about the future of patient care, direct primary care. My opinion is that wellness occurs between a family and their doctor, not a third party. Direct primary care is what medicine is meant to be. It has fully restored my passion for my job. It has also given me the freedom to live my life in a way that I've never had before. I'm Dr. Daniel Dvoskin of Jolly Giant Pediatrics in Taylor, Texas, and this is my DPC story. Dr. Dvoskin, known to most patients as Dr. Daniel, was born in Ukraine and immigrated to Brooklyn, New York, where he spent his early childhood. Fluent in English and Russian, he earned a Bachelor of Science in Biological Science from Florida International University and a Doctor of Medicine from William Carey University College of Osteopathic Medicine in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Dr. Daniel launched his pediatric medicine career at Baylor Scott and White McLean Children's, where he completed his residency in 2022. He worked with Texas Children's Hospital until he started his current practice. He has a passion for forming relationships with patients and watching them grow alongside their families. When he is not seeing patients, Dr. Daniel enjoys spending time with his wife, who is an optometrist in Hutto, and daughter. His other hobbies include creative writing and automotive sports. Each summer, he volunteers at a camp in Kerrville for patients with type 1 diabetes. Community outreach is important to Dr. Daniel, and he looks forward to planting roots in the Taylor area. Thank you so much for tuning in. Find out more about direct primary care, including resources, my favorite tech tools, books, and more at mydpcstory.com. The mapper of our guests has also been updated, so you can look for practices by specialty now. Follow us on your social media platforms with our handle at mydpcstory, and be sure to subscribe to our newsletter and, of course, the podcast itself, so you won't miss when the next episode drops. With that, let me welcome our guest. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Daniel. Thank you. I'm excited. I am so excited to be chatting with you also. I think I was talking with somebody earlier today about where are most people in their DPC journey? And my answer was all over the board. There's people planning in medical school to do DPC. There's people 20 years into practice who are doing DPC now. But for you, you just graduated 2022 from residency. And it's quite amazing to see the breadth of people who are choosing to do DPC and when. But I want to take even a greater step back because your growing up years was between different countries. So in 1998, you came to America from Ukraine and it was with your mom and your maternal grandparents. So can you start us off with what ended up bringing you over to the States? Yeah, so my mom wanted to always come to America, but it was a very difficult process, and my grandparents as well. Well, when the Soviet Union collapsed, they won a green card through a lottery system that was occurring in the early 90s. So they emigrated first, and then once they gained their citizenship, it took some time. They were able to call me and my mom, and that's how we came to this country. And we were in Brooklyn because Brooklyn in New York is a very predominantly large Russian population. So for exclusive Russian speakers, they're able to ingrain themselves into the American society significantly easier because the chances of someone being able to speak Spanish or translate into English is much higher. 
And that's where I spent the first, I would say, kind of five years of my American life. I did most of elementary school there. And then eventually we did move away to Florida. And I just think that when people move different places, you pick up different things along the way. And so I want to ask you, especially for yourself and for your mom and your grandparents, different generations, what was healthcare access and experience like between the USSR and the States? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it definitely is drastically different. And to be honest with you, even my family's experience during the Soviet Union is almost incomparable to what medicine is there like today. But as far as back then, a lot, most of medicine was government fun. All of your doctors got graduated from state funded schools. They went to state funded hospital systems and clinics. You almost didn't even really get a chance to choose where you went as a medical professional. You were told this small town and, you know, close to Siberia needs a doctor and this is where you're going and you had no opinion or choices. So the care that you received was very stratified and specialists were non-existent. So if you did have something complicated, you had to go either into like a big city like Kiev or Moscow to go see a specialist. And I mean, if you even got in, it would be impossible. And to be honest with you, unfortunately, there's a lot of just under the table corruption. So sometimes you wouldn't even get in unless you were able to pay that extra fee to get in and get seen on time. So it was seldom and hard to get. And then when my family moved to America, honestly, the biggest trouble is actually understanding that medicine actually functions here. You can get medical care. That was the biggest difference. And insurance was also a very big concept that people didn't understand, and my family especially, and how it worked and what's a deductible, what's a copay, what do you mean I'm paying them every month for something that I don't use? Very difficult, very hard to swallow. But eventually, we were able to learn all the logistics and figure things out, and we got significantly better care. Just to give you an example, my both of my grandparents are in their late 80s right now. And they are thriving and living in Miami and going to the beach all the time. My grandpa, who's 89, is still driving, you know, not far, but he still could go to the grocery store. While his equivalents that stayed there, they have all passed at this point. And the same goes for his parents. His parents passed away in the 60s. So modern medicine has given them the ability to live much longer, happier lives. And I I just think it's so appropriate that you went into pediatrics just because longevity starts with childhood. Mm -hmm. It starts with coping mechanisms. Oh, yeah. Exercising. So I think it's very cool that you see really making an investment in the young generations is going to lead to people like your grandpa driving around at 89 (laughs) to the grocery store. It's awesome. I love that. So tell us about your experience in Florida, because I'm so excited to ask you about Mississippi. One of my best friends in medical school is from Clinton, Mississippi, which is next nice. to Hattiesburg. And so when I read that, I was like, amazing, but can't forget Florida because again, wherever we go, we pick things up along the way. So how was your journey in medicine while you were in Florida? Yeah. So when I lived in Florida, that was predominantly where I started leaning towards medicine. I was lucky that I went to a high school that had advanced classes in science and biology, like AP credits and college credits and things of that fashion. And it sparked an interest because I had very thoughtful, helpful teachers. And there was a local hospital that did take volunteers. So me and a buddy of mine would volunteer at the emergency department and also at the triage center. And we had very minor roles, things as simple as just help, you know, get a patient into a room or go get some warm blankets or something like that. Very simple, but I got used to the hospital setting and I was able to observe what was going on. And that was the biggest thing for me. And it really opened up my eyes. And to be honest with you, when I actually first was got the idea of medicine, For me, I put science as the most paramount goal in my early career. So I was really focusing on oncology. It's only later in uh, the Mississippi adventure that I'll share with you that I changed my mind. And I was like, okay, I think pediatrics is the right fit for me. But I got exposed early and I definitely got all of the help in college because that's also where I went uh, to college in Florida. And all of my teachers and core classes and advanced classes, they really opened up my eyes into medicine and solidified the fact 
if anything, I try to go out of my way to dissuade myself from going into medicine and failed. It's it's so funny to hear that because, you know, there's people who are in DPC who have kids and they're like, I would never tell my kids to go into medicine. And then other people are like, absolutely, I would push my kids into medicine. And it's like, no matter what we do, our parents saying what to do is one thing. But then when I hear you saying that you were trying to convince yourself of something else and different career, I, I laugh because it speaks to also what you're called to do. So tell us about your internal conversation and what happened in Mississippi. Yeah, absolutely. So when I went to Mississippi, or actually, if we take one step back, when I was applying to medical schools, my goal was I need to get out of Florida because I've got ingrained with one specific culture, one specific patient population. And I'm not going to lie, Miami does have a relatively healthier overall group of people, especially with how many young people there are. So I wanted to see, you know, a different way of life. So when I was doing my applications, I did apply broadly. And I was lucky that in very early in the cycle, I got invited to Hattiesburg, Mississippi or at William Carey. It was, I want to say, early October. And I went in for the interview. When I came into the building, they didn't even know who I was or what was going on because we were the first interview group on the first day of interviews and no one was ready for us whatsoever. But eventually, they, you know, we figured everything out. We had the interview process and it sold me immediately because, I mean, just the accents alone was completely different. So I did eventually get into a couple of other schools, but this was definitely the school I was going to just because of how drastically different it was. And the people who started the school, which it was a relatively new school at that point in time, they cared. If anything, I would say we had this one anatomy professor who went above and beyond for us. So I decided to stay in Mississippi and do my medical education there. And because it's a new school, they didn't have all the rotations in one central hospital. So we had the opportunity to go to different locations. I picked two major rotational hubs. One of them was Macomb, Mississippi, which is a small town of, I want to say maybe three streets and a community hospital. And I also picked Covington or kind of North New Orleans as a, a second hub site. But when I was in McComb, Mississippi, they had a very traditional pediatric group. And what I mean by that, it is it was three pediatricians with a couple of uh, mid-levels, and they did A to Z. And I mean deliveries and admissions, and they operated the nursery, and they saw patients in the clinic. They did everything. But they were super busy, but no one minded that they were super busy. It was a very family-like experience and they knew everyone. Like during my rotation there, it was, you know, you're not coming in to just go see the doctor and, you know, fix your medical visits. It was, you know, little kids coming over to you and he wants to argue who's stronger, Hulk or Thor. And it was those kind of conversations. It was the genuine happiness and it was the just the cheer of everything, but then also the seriousness of when, hey, this is a sick kiddo. I got to turn on my doctor brain and we got to take care of the situation. And that kind of care and the relationships was definitely what sold me. And then I, it was third year of med school. As you know, that's when you start like, oh, I'm going to go go on all my QI. I mean, uh, my rotations away for residency. And I had to change my entire application because I was about to do FM. But it was so worth it. And today I could not imagine not being in pediatrics. It's so cool. It's so cool. So tell us then, Going into third year and fourth year, what compounded that desire to go into peds that you saw when you were applying for residency? The thing that kind of reacted in my heart the most was if you look at kind of what's going on just overall in medicine and in healthcare, the biggest issues come from honestly lack of self care and lack of understanding how to take care of yourself. And if you're not seeing your pediatrician, if you're not having those conversations, if you're not teaching the parents how to do the appropriate thing, if you're not having those tough discussions with those teenagers, then yeah, they will start life and they will stumble and they will fall. And yes, some of them will empower themselves and get out of that rut. But sometimes the things that can happen at an early age compound significantly when you're older, just like compound interest works. That's why you got to start early. 
So that plus the passion and the happiness and the fact that a kid never wants to be sick. They always want to get better. Parents will always want their kid to be healthy. And kids are so much more just excited to live life and do what they want to do. And getting them or allowing them to do that just melted everything on the insides. I love it. You know, we're going to talk about your DPC mm-hmm. later, but like, yeah. I, kudos to your wife, dude. I just like, I, I can feel the jolly giant like coming through. <laughs> That's so awesome. And I just, I think that it it's also, I mean, you know this, it's like in primary care, there's certain people who are like totally peds, you know, those memes that they have out there were like, <laughs> oh yeah, this person is like definitely peds. This person's family medicine. This person's neurology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This person's radiology and they're not there. Like there's nobody. There's the, there's the um, ophthalmologist who has that like famous uh, uh, YouTube. Dr. Glockham Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Like when the peds come out and they have like rainbows and uh, like a unicorn horn, that is absolutely me. Like I have funny <laughs> hats and I have pink shoes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Oh, your daughter is so lucky. I love this. I love <laughs> Thanks. it. So tell me now, because you then went into residency and then this amazing pandemic that we just survived through happened and COVID is still like going crazy in Hawaii right now as we're talking. But like, what was your experience like because you were practicing as a resident doctor during COVID? Yeah, so I'm not going to lie. Took us by surprise and it was scary. So residency started and everything was going fine. And it was about six months plus in. And we started hearing like little kindling of what was happening in Italy, because that's kind of when I caught on to it. And I even specifically remember having this conversation. I called my mom and I'm like, Mom, this is what's happening in Italy is going to happen here, except it's going to be even worse because our population is so much larger. And she was like, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, it happened. But honestly, residency changed drastically. We lost a lot of our clinic rotations and specialty rotations. We did not have PPE. I mean, did I run into multiple code rooms without appropriate PPE? Absolutely. We built makeshift walls for isolation units. We didn't, even if we were trying to make up appropriate protocols, I mean, they were hard to follow, to be honest. And then no one knew what was going on. We were all relying on the Seattle data and the Boston data, but the Seattle data came in first and we were trying to figure everything out. And then the whole MIAC thing really threw us for a curveball because the smartest person in my residency, in my opinion, was our infectious disease doctor. And he was like, I don't know. I have no idea. And that was scary. We actually, we had, we did have a few expecting mom residents and we sent them home. We were like, just go home. We don't know what the risks are. So yeah, it was a scary, dark time. I'm so happy that we have the information that we have now, but it all completely altered how residency was and the experiences and the amount of fatigue. <laughs> Stay with us. We'll be right back. Have you tried an AI scribe in your clinic? Well, I've tried so many, and I can say Heidi Health is the best AI scribe I have come across thus far. With Heidi Health, I can create unlimited, customizable templates for my notes to help me truly cut down on the time I'm spending charting. Template for pediatric well child check? Done. Template for weight loss management? Done. Some of my favorite things I've built into my AI template beyond the general soap note are having a list of actionables for our team to take after a patient visit, having the diagnoses listed, and creating an after-visit summary for our patients. Not only have I found Heidi Health to be the most helpful, customizable AI scribe so far, it's also more affordable than most out there. So try Heidi Health today and see how you can harness the power of an AI scribe for your practice. To get an entire month of Heidi Pro free, go to the homepage of mydpcstory.com and click on the Heidi Health ad. And that's that's a huge thing that I really pick up just from your timeline of history, just because by December 23, you were donezo with fee-for-service. You know, I, I was reading on, I think it was LinkedIn today, where somebody uh-huh. was quoting this, you know, like I will totally say fake news study where they were saying like, oh, in pediatrics, burnout is less than 50%. And it's for the first time it's been like that in so many years. I'm like, and is that why there's less residents? Is that why there's less people applying to pediatric residencies and it didn't fill? 
if you're out there listening and you're like, oh no, that is true. Like, please leave a voicemail on the podcast voicemail. I'd love to hear that opinion because I'm totally with you in that. Are you kidding me? Who is not burned out in fee-for-service? Even people who stay in fee-for-service, it's not like they're celebrating all the time. Like, oh, I have autonomy and I have the ability to do things like whatever, you know, fill in the blank that they want to. So tell us about, I don't know if there is a, a way to separate or if the COVID pandemic amplified, but like what was happening in your residency where you were like, within a year, I am done with fee-for-service. Honestly, for me was I learned accidentally that DPC existed in med school. I ran across a book that just described a family medicine practitioner and how he went about his life. And I was like, what is this? So I like flipped through the entire book in like three days. And it just sat there, right? Because I'm like, I have boards to take, a residency to get into, survive residency, but it was sitting there. And what I butted heads with the most on, especially in patient services, is that the patient's here for a problem and it's an acute problem. And yes, we're going to fix it. But what's stopping them from coming back? And the amount of repeat customers, which I'm sorry to say it, but that's what it ended up being, was significant. And then when you start analyzing why, it's because primary care isn't happening. That frustrated me. And when I wanted to do more because I wanted to keep them out of the hospital, it's not a fun time being in a hospital, even as much as we try to make it with child life and games and just, you know, being fun. It's still not a fun time. You want to go back to your normal life. And I just couldn't, like, I just hit a stone wall because I have notes to do, orders to make 15, you know, other patients to see in that two hour time window. And it was impossible. And it, the same thing happened when I was in my continuity clinic is I would love to sit and have more discussion about how we're going to treat your depression or manage your ADHD or, Hey, this is a one month checkup and you have a million questions, but you don't even know if you, how to ask them. So having those the time to have that conversation, it wasn't there. And I understand that's the way the system is built, but doesn't mean I have to participate. Totally. It's ironic. This is very, this is a peds conversation. So I'm going to say it, but man, this is the summer that Inside Out 2 came out. And I just, I had to rewatch Inside Out 1 yeah. because the kids are little, but it was like, I can picture the islands just becoming gray and dying as you're like, yeah. Your, Absolutely. your unicorn self is like, this is crap, man. So yeah. I think it is awesome that you went DPC because you can see the happiness. If you're watching the YouTube, like you can see the light coming through rather than the, like the dull, yeah. like I can't be doing this for 30 years. So yeah. let me ask you there then, yeah. because I did not know that you had learned about in med school, what did you think about through all of medical school, through residency? And how did you plan to open your DPC? Yeah, so honestly, my biggest thing in residency and med school was I just need to get there. So I put the DPT thing in the back of my head and I, it just sat there. And then it came around to third year of residency and I was like, okay, I'm going to graduate. I'll be a doctor. And I want to learn because one thing that becoming a doctor teaches you is how to become a student. So that was my main objective. I want to learn as much as I can about how I can do this in a non-academic or non-major corporation in the hospital system. So I found a group that was a private practice group, but traditional fee-for-service group here in the kind of Austin area. And I was like, perfect. I'm just going to apply, see what happens. It turned out that they offered me a position and I accepted that position. The unfortunate part is what I did not learn is that in a very short period of time, Texas Children's Hospital or Texas Children's Pediatrics bought them out. And my contract was sold to them and they did give me the opportunity to come on board or leave if I wanted to. At that point in time, I was three or four months out of residency. I was like, I need a paycheck. I have a you know wife and a kid on the way. We need to work. but. In my head, I was like, where's that box? I'm going to go fetch that box. It's time to open it. And while I was working at my other job, I was like, okay, how can I make this happen with no backing, with, to be honest with you, not a lot of savings. You know, my wife, thankfully, has been an optometrist longer and 
in her career and a little ahead of time. But I mean, I'm starting out from nothing. Like I have no savings. So I was just like, how do I make this work? And then where do I make this work? And that's when the plan started hatching out. And it took me about a year because our daughter was born during that same process. I decided to buy a house, have my first child, get married, and start a business all within like 13, 12 months. Not the smartest person in the world. But I was able to do all of those things and it started there. And the biggest kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back for me was I was working under the new regime and I have my wife with our three month old at home and I'm in clinic until 6 p.m. after they've, the nurses and MAs have already left. All the lights are off. Why? Because I have a kid here who needs to have a good medical plan and an understanding about what is going on with them. And then I walked them out the door and it didn't happen once. It didn't happen twice. It was a regular occurrence. I was the one who was coming in at seven o'clock to the office instead of eight because I needed to answer those inbox messages because I had a very large mental health population that they need that care. They can't do the, oh, I'll get back to that inbox message in three days. And I found myself sacrificing my family, sacrificing my personal health just so I could provide the care that I knew I needed to provide. And I wasn't willing to become subpar in my own standards. I'm sure there are people who are just pausing, shaking their head, totally empathizing with that because it is real. When you look at how come everybody else gets to go home because they know they're like, I'm not getting paid overtime for this. And they go home and then the doctors yeah. are frequently there where it's like our jobs are not eight to five. That's <laughs> just yeah. and health does not happen eight to five. Yeah. Oh. And medicine doesn't happen in 15 minutes. Like that's not how it works. Not at all. And especially when you're dealing with mental health, it's, you know, already yeah. we know that in this country, mental health, quality mental health access is challenging no matter where you are. So let me ask you there, because you are the go big or go home on many levels, but it's like house, kid, why not? Just throw in another business. Come on, let's do it. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, Dr. Natalie Gentili. She's like, her husband asked her not to start another business like in one year. It was, it was so funny. So let me ask you there, when you were with all of these things, how did you then balance your time so that you could be present as a doctor proud as a doctor, but also present and proud as a dad and as a budding entrepreneur? I'll be honest, I have no idea. <laughs> to this day, my family, including my wife, is like, you're doing too much. One thing that helped me, I guess, is time management, right? So I started this in med school is everything goes on a calendar and I pretty much track the hours that are that's going on and I have a task list. And that's literally the only way, like, I just, I need to do this. So there's a want and a need, and I'm really good at differentiating that. And there's like, I need to do this. And how do I make it happen? If there's hours in the day where I'm awake, I'm not going to do the Netflix and hang out. I'm going to do, if I come from work and my daughter's awake, I'm spending two hours with her. And then I'm going to go into the garage and I'm going to do what I need to do until it's 1030. And I just drop dead to sleep and I wake up at 4 30 I feed her and then go about my day like if there's hours where you're doing something you can do it is it exhausting do I recommend it absolutely not did I take way too much on yes I just didn't see another way I couldn't keep functioning in the old that way and be happy and fulfilled and feel that my 11 years of training and sacrifice were worth it I mean, I just think about how after your family was so lucky enough to win the lottery, like it's not easy emulating into a new society of any kind, but you do it. I mean, like I come from a family of immigrants also, and my dad didn't speak English. He thought that snow was some weird white stuff and was surprised when he motorbiked without any covering over his ears to Canada and his ears were curled in. It is not easy, but... Yeah you people do hard things. And I think especially with, you know, this idea of resilience, we're resilient in general, just because we're doctors, it is not easy to go to medical school, it is not easy to be a resident. And yet we are, and yet we complete those things, and then we go on. So I think that there's a lot of parts of our medical training, in addition to whatever background we come from, that really helps us 
focus in and achieve what we want to, because we know we can't do the other thing. So for you, your practice, and again, I spilled the beans too early, but tell us about Jolly Giant Pediatrics, because I love the name. I love your website. It just screams pediatrics and it screams bright with the with the blue background and the the toys there. So tell us about how you picked your clinic name and how you even chose to practice in Taylor. Yeah, absolutely. So the clinic name was actually a little bit of a struggle bus. I'm not going to lie. Me and my wife, we used to go on walks, especially when she was in her third trimester, just to like get some of the fluid off our legs. And when we walked, we used to think about clinic names and baby names. So that was kind of the theme of the conversation. So when we came up to the clinic name, we were just thinking like, what are we going to call it? It's got to be something fun, but unique. Also on the communicating that it's pediatrics, but you don't want to be like generic either. And, and I'll get to why we we're opening up in Taylor, but I was like, oh, how about tailoring like the service, right? And then it could be like Taylor Pediatrics instead of, you know, the town, it would be spelled like the service. And she was like, yeah, but it's kind of like me. And then I was like, yeah, you're probably right. I'm being too logical about it. Then on my off time, I would like go to AI and be like, I am opening a direct primary care practice. What should I name it? And that was just, you know, kind of got a bunch of silly things, but it didn't really help out too much. And then we were walking and then she's like, well, it, what are you doing in VPC, right? It's like, you are the practice. So let's see how we could circle this on you and then also make it pediatric oriented. Well, you know, the Jolly Green Giant obviously came to my head because I'm like, okay, well, that's a really fun kind of name and everyone is aware of that. So we we're thinking, okay, we obviously can't do green, but Jolly Giant works. And then how can we incorporate that into like me and the practice and pediatrics? And then I'm like, well, kids are usually jolly and they have big personalities. So that works. I'm relatively just a big kid. So that works as far as description of me. And I was like, okay, let me just, you know, put it on the list. Right. And then the closer I got to forming my LLC and I was just like, okay, nothing else is clicking. It's just, you know, let me go get a graphics designer and like get a little bit of a design going. And then I was like, once we saw it in person, it locked it in. And I was like, yeah, this is going to be it. This is going to be great. And we went with it and I've had good feedback on people saying it stands out. It's not just something pediatrics. It brings up an idea. And I think that's the goal. For those people who are watching the YouTube video, like we look like the same height and I'll take any inches I can get. But like when you look at a picture of you and your wife, there's definitely a difference there. So how tall are you? And how tall is your wife? So if people see those pictures, they can get the... Uh, yeah. So my wife's by four, standard white American, and I'm six <laughs> six. <laughs> so definitely the name is super appropriate. I love that the audience can hear the, the workings, how you got to this place of your name, because I think that's where, you know, you have things like Thrive is trademarked by Kaiser. You have Ascension, you have all these things. But when you're your own boss, when it's a practice that represents the doctor you are and the doctor that you're bringing to the community... I think it's amazing that we see such personalization out there. We see people pulling from different parts of their life to create the story with their name or whatever it calls them. So I think it's it's amazing. So now about Taylor, because you were doing residency and whatnot in Austin. Austin's about 45 minutes, our Austin proper. Yeah. So guys. I was doing residency in Temple, which is a little bit north of Austin at McLean Children's in Baylor Scott and White. And then I, we moved down to Austin just because that's where I accepted my job. And my wife works in Hutto, which is a little bit east. So I know a whole lot of things, but think of it this way. Just Austin's in the middle and my wife was east. And Hutto used to be just middle of nowhere town. And there's another town next to it called Taylor. And if you go back into the 1800s, it was just a farming town. And then what happened was it had its boom in the post-war 1950s, 1960s time period. And then industry kind of left it behind and advanced and went forward. And Taylor in the 90s and through the 2000s was your typical Western dying town of nothing happening, nothing changing. Whoever's here is just the old folks that have been here from when they were younger. And then there was Samsung. Samsung, as you guys know, is a massive company, and they invested over $20 billion into the affair that is their factory and everything around it. And me and my wife learned about that. And I was like, okay, well, we should 
take a look into Taylor, see what's going on. Well, I met with the Chamber of Commerce who have been an exceptional help in everything for me from a business perspective and even a medical perspective. And I started looking into the facts. The facts are that there's about 9,000 children currently from the 2021 statistics that either come to Taylor or come through Taylor. There's a couple of surrounding towns, but there's about 9,000 ch children that come through and there's about 3,500 children that are actually in Taylor proper as far as the school district. And the closest pediatrician is 20 miles away. And if you want to get significant pediatric care, like, you know, a hospital or something like that, well, you're driving an hour either to Temple, which is Northwest, or to Austin, there's nowhere else to go. Like, that's it. There is one pediatric nurse practitioner here in town. She's been swamped and also has a limited scope of practice, relatively speaking. She doesn't do mental health. She doesn't do adolescent medicine at all. And she's in a typical Medicaid-exclusive driven clinic. So she's seeing the typical 30 to 40 patients a day. So she's swamped and, once again, not practicing full-spectrum pediatric care. So I was like, well, Taylor's definitely where I have to go then. Austin in itself is highly competitive in the pediatric world. And I also didn't just want to be another doctor in Austin. And I felt like this community could benefit from my services. And I also will have the opportunity to be ingrained in the community. I didn't want to be just another doctor in the city. I wanted to be the community doctor. Like how in the 1940s, you go to the grocery store and everyone's like, oh, hey, there's Dr. Shepard. And how you doing? And yo, the cashier, you know, I've been seeing him since I was a little one. Well, that kind of idea got stuck in my head. So that's why I picked Taylor. I had the opportunity to, the town is starting to grow, but it's not fully there, but there's room for growth. So I could expand and sustain myself, but it's also still early. So I could come in and get in touch with the community, ingrain myself in the community and just grow with it. I think that's awesome. And I love that your chamber has been supportive because especially as you grow, chambers in general, they're so supportive of local businesses because those are their members. And so they're always like, oh, you you should talk to blah, 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 or you should. Do. And so oh, yeah. you're already ingrained. And just like this whole movement right now, like we're really in the, the beginnings of how this country is going to experience healthcare innovation because of what we're doing for greater masses. And I think that it's like when... I mean, I'm from California. So like gold rush, you know, bear with my gold rush likenesses, but it's like the people who got those plots of land early and they mined and they found all the gold because nobody else had. And so I think that this is really awesome that you were looking at the demographics, that you were doing your due diligence to figure out like where is care needed. And the fact that you could bring comprehensive care, I think is also very it's what all pediatric clinics and primary care clinics should be able to do, in my opinion. Because it doesn't even matter if you're rural or urban, it's like nobody's getting this quality care when they're locked into only fee-for-service access. So I think this is great. Now, in terms of your practice, because you, you know, were in this spot of like, you're wearing all the hats and you're like, you know, didn't really have this big nest egg that I was going to open my DPC with, you have offered, in addition to memberships, one-off visits. So tell us about that experience because it does help get the word out about like, oh my God, did you know that Dr. Daniel's over here at Jolly Giant? Yeah, absolutely. So my idea was I needed to create a medical home. I wanted for people to, yes, even if you're not a member, at least you could come in, either get seen, get taken care of. Honestly, sometimes I had one particular family, they just moved to the area, like they just needed some formula. So I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Here, I have a bunch. That medical home, I wanted to allow for anyone to be able to come in. So I didn't want to exclusively have membership only access. I wanted to give people the, app, the ability, hey, you know what? Maybe a membership model is too expensive or we can't afford the monthly payments, but we'll save up or do whatever we got to do. And we'll come in for that one-time visit because I need my kid to go to school or I need to really evaluate this particular pathology that my normal pediatrician doesn't have the time to. So I wanted to give that opportunity for everyone in this area or even around because I do also offer virtual one-time visits. And I feel like it's paid off significantly because yes, my membership panel is growing slowly and steadily. Obviously it's summer, so it's like super slow. 
but the one-time visits have been a consistent thing that also have their ebbs and flow, but people always do utilize them. I'll give you an example. Actually, right before we connected, I had a mom just call me. They're from Louisiana because the father's on the project for Samsung and construction. And they're here just for a few months, but they got a sick one-year-old. Where are they going to go? If they, no matter the insurance that they have out of state, getting care in a different state is going to be impossible. Well, I sent her a text message. She could schedule an appointment by herself on my website. And she's going to know exactly how much it's going to cost because the fees are right there up front and I'm not going to charge anything extra. There's nothing hidden. You can get that anywhere else. So I wanted to offer that for everyone so everyone could get care. I think it's great. And again, it's if you've seen 1DBC, you've seen 1DBC. So if that works for your community, amen. But I think that it's really important to be able to recognize that you can change your processes at any time. Like we live in a vacation community. And people are always calling us about like, oh, do you offer one-off visits? And we do, but we get all the time, oh, but I need to use my insurance. I'm like, fantastic. Down the hill, 45 minutes away, ER, where where do you want to go? That's your choice. Amen. But I think it's very awesome that even people who are temporarily in places, they recognize like, oh my God, I didn't think about where are we going to get medical care when... There's no, there's nobody here. Like, even if we have insurance, there's no one to see us, there's no one to take it. So it's interesting, again, going into market research, how to find your spot. Now, I want to ask more about you getting involved in the community because you've definitely taken on roles as you have opened your DPC. One, I'm guessing because you have time and two, because I'm sure yes. that you love to do it. And like you said, be part of the community. So tell us about your community involvement beyond being a physician in the community. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll be honest with you, this is the part of running your own business or just being a physician in the community that I didn't really expect. And I am loving it. I'll be honest. So I'm a big car guy. So I'm like, okay, I need to do something with cars while I'm trying to get families together. Kids love cars, especially fun, weird ones. So I found the city councilman who's apparently a massive car nut. And then I started learning about Taylor. And apparently Taylor is actually a very big car community. They have yearly car shows and monthly car shows. So me and the councilman got together and I was like, okay, so you're already hosting these things. Let me like glue on to you and then offer a little pediatric spin to it. So we do Coco during fall and winter and we do popsicles during uh, kind of spring and summertime. And I invite any kids to come through and families and make it a family friendly event. And then, you know, there's a pediatrician there. So if you have any questions or want to chit chat, you could always can. But for the most part, it just opens the community to like just a public setting for to hang out, do something early on the Saturday or Sunday morning and have a snack, have fun, check out some cool cars, meet some cool people. And that's kind of how it started. And then I started meeting people throughout the community. I met one of the school kind of family care coordinators and, you know, I met him and then he was telling me like, hey, you know, we got a big vaccine issue. We had to kick 40 something kids out of school because they weren't caught up to their vaccines. And I'm like, well, that's easy. Let's just do a vaccine drive. He's like, we've tried to, we've had these issues. No one's been leading it and we don't have a medical director. And I'm like, sign me up. Where do I sign? So that all transpired in a relatively quick fashion. But yeah, I signed up to be the Taylor School District Medical Director because no one else was doing it. And it's not like a paid position or anything, but the school needed it. So I was able to get all of their procedures in order, get them all the medications and start this vaccine drive. I'm hoping to make this an annual situation, but this is going to be the first year we're doing it and we're doing two, one in July and one in August, but it's just an opportunity. And then the other part is just meeting the local businesses, getting out into the community and also learning about marketing. By learning how to market myself, I exposed myself to so many new people and so many new opportunities. I'll just give you an example. I recently became a board member of a restoration project of a 100 or 104 year old movie theater. It used to be right on the main street and COVID killed it from a business perspective. And it just sat there derelict, falling apart. This one brave woman decided to buy it and restore it. And she brought the entire community behind her because the movie theater has been here through everything. So there's generations of people who had their first kiss and their first date and stuff there or their first job. So I joined that board membership just to help the community, just have fun and meet people. 
Then another part of that was I wrote a children's book. And honestly, the goal of the children's book was mostly for marketing. And I wanted to create a Jolly Giant character because eventually I want the Jolly Giant to be a character and use that as like, oh, like my kids are going to like hanging out with Jolly Giant Pediatrics or, you know, eventually I do want to make a teddy bear kind of thing. But I wanted to have an image as well. So I wrote a book and then there's a local bookstore that's the private bookstore. And I'm like, hey, you guys want to do some story time? And they're like, oh, my God, this would be great. So I'm doing that. And then I went to the local library when I first got here and I was just like, hey, I see you guys do story time. Do you would you be interested in doing also a lecture series piggying back from that same population that are coming to story time, which are usually your new moms? I know they don't have a pediatrician to talk to. I almost guarantee it. So they're like, oh my God, this would be fantastic. Yes, please. So we set that up. Um, I'm actually, after we finish here, I'm going to do a vaccine lecture there. But, you know, we set that up and everything grows slowly. I've only been here for six months, but I've tried to set myself up where I have routine things to give people access to the care that they need. And, you know, they don't even have to be my patient. They could just there's a pediatrician in town we could talk to. And my hope is that I am going to be able to increase the pediatric care in this community. I'm partnering up with like a Texas statewide mental health grant funding for counselors and being able to help some of the kids here from a mental health perspective. I'm trying to get specialists into this area. I just recently got a lactation specialist. Once again, first lactation specialist in the city. I'm also trying to get a therapist. And so just trying to grow this area to give this area the care that it needs and doesn't have. I think it's awesome. And I think that it makes me think about because you are a DPC doctor, as you grow, you're going to set your schedule so that you can still do the things that make you happy. You know, it's not like I'm not able to do this anymore because I have to work an eight to five job. Oh, sorry. It's actually eight to eight. And I only get paid for whatever codes I bring in, not even the hours that I'm there. So when you have these things that you know you love and it's like, I love doing this podcast. I've never met you before. And I'm like, I love that I get to talk with you. You know, it's like you do these things and you're like, this brings me joy and you get to do them. And it, that literally helps fend off the burnout, the fed up, the attitude that you go into to see your patients that they can pick up on. So let's talk about your marketing even beyond the meeting people and networking, which is super needed and I think very strategic in terms of your growth later on, in addition to the teddy bear and the jolly giant figure. But your page, like on the banner, you say, learn about us by following our Instagram, or you can sign up for membership now. And I thought that was really awesome because there's people, usually you'll find like Instagram, I mean, even on our page, like at the very bottom. But I love that most likely you're going to have people, I mean, we all do, but especially when you're a pediatric practice, families and younger people are going to be especially on social media. So I love that you had that just right there, because even if we can't read the page all the way, but we can look at social media because we do that anyways. It's like it's an invitation to see you and meet you, even if they're going to your website or if they're going to social media. So tell us about that whole idea. Where did that come from and how has it worked for you? And do you see people clicking more on the, you know, go to our Instagram versus sign up? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll be honest, coming into this, I knew kids about marketing, like absolutely bupkis. Most of my time in med school and college was medicine and cars. That's it. So I needed a role model and putting Phil Boucher on a pedestal. He is a DPC practice, but he is a little bit more advanced as far as like how long he's been practicing medicine. He's also done a lot of marketing himself and he offers marketing advice. And I met him at the pediatric DPC mastermind and whatever he does, I'm just like, three ears open listening. And then I tried to look into just like basic marketing facts as well, right? So you have your print media, you have your digital media, and then you have your community. And then in my mind, I was like, print media is cool, but not really useful. Like maybe if you have something cool to give someone like a book, Sure, that's going to stay around because they're going to read the story to their kids or show the pictures or something like that. But for the most part, advertising on the paper media is just a waste of your time at this point. And everyone I've talked to said the same thing. So then it came to social media. And as far as the social media aspect of things, and you know, Phil says this as well. Yes, the social media might not be a conversion for you, 
But what it will do is get your face out there and get people to know you. And as long as you're not sitting out there being too salesy, they might even listen. So my objective and what I want to do is I'm in primary care. I want to educate. I want to give people the tools and the ideas of what to do. So I thought, well, that's what the Instagram is going to be about. I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm just trying to provide the care that I want and answer the questions that parents potentially have or may not even know they have. So that's how I started it. And most of my Instagram is either about certain events that are happening, tips and tricks, or just videos about me talking about like, hey, maybe you should do this and that and like what's positive reinforcement. And that's mostly predominantly what I focus on. And then, yes, the community of involvement that we already talked to. As far as what hits, you're absolutely right. The social media is such a much more paramount way for me to get people in and understand about the practice or just get to meet me before they meet me kind of thing. The amount of phone calls that I get that are first like, do you accept new patients? And then the second is, do you accept this insurance? just shows that no one reads through the website. And then I go into my Google Analytics and I look at what people click onto. And yeah, everyone gets to the homepage and then everyone goes to membership and then they don't understand or I don't know what happens because it goes from home, membership, and then all the other pages are like slim to none. So obviously they either click out or they called me or they just don't care. And yeah, selling the idea of DPC to an environment that's not even used to getting pediatric care is rough. And there's definitely areas that this idea would have sold a little bit easier, you know, especially in a little bit more of an affluent area, probably would have done a little bit better and quicker, but that's not my goal. Uh, my goal is to give this community the care that they need and also grow with them as they grow. And, you know, hopefully I will as well. And I will say that because the community is growing that you have that SEO now, and as it grows, it's just going to follow with you. So I think that, you know, it's, there's definitely pros and cons to slow growth. I mean, Dr. Erin Harris is a great example. She had for five years with her DPC open, she had a very small handful of patients and then she blew up and different reasons. But in terms of the don't lose hope talk, that's what that comment is about because there are so many people to support and answer questions and do all of the, the things that can help you be a successful business owner. So let me ask you there now, because you have this DPC practice where you can tailor your care to the kids, where you are able to provide mental health, where there's nobody else really doing it in your community, how do you practice differently because you get to call the shots and you get to help your patients and their families how they need help? So kind of an example I always like to bring up, at least to my in my head, and sometimes when I speak to other docs, is I had a professor in medical school, and he said, this is the best physical exam you'll ever do. When you go out to practice, you will never do a complete physical exam. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, shh. yeah, come on. Of course, how do doctors not do a complete physical exam? So they'll just miss so much information. Well, you know, naive medical student. Now, being in the shoes that I am, I feel I could say this is the most complete medicine that I've ever done. That I've never been able to do because of time constraints, coding constraints, whatever the situation may be. I like to bring this example up because honestly, I left that day happy, even though I worked more. I had a woman come from a border town with an infant kid was two weeks old by herself, no family support. And the father figure was in her life, but he was working, trying to support everyone. And she was by herself very young and didn't know what to do. So we spent an hour and a half on a Friday. I blocked off the rest of my schedule and I taught her how to feed, how to make formula, how to look after her kid, what to do, what to expect. And then she came back on Monday and we kind of rehashed things and, you know, made sure everything was going okay, did a full, you know, weight check and made sure the baby's doing fine. And I was able to provide that kind of care. And then if she had anything, thankfully she did well, but if she had anything on the weekend, she could have texted me or called me and I would have helped out. And that's what medicine is. Like I'm able to secure this child's health, reassure and give the skills to the mom and support them the way I should be able to support them, which is not a way I would have ever been able to support them in the fee-for-service model. 
So yeah, absolutely. It's drastically different. I've had another eating disorder patient in a residential facility and we were having issues. So I was able to spend an hour with mom and the medical director on like a Zoom call and we were just able to hash everything out, have a discharge plan, figure out how what we're going to do in residential. I would have never been able to dedicate such time in my fee-for-service clinic. Even if I sacrificed my lunch, which I ended up doing anyway, I still would not have had an hour to sit down and do those kind of things. And I was able to secure that patient's discharge and have an easy outgoing situation, especially with a teenager and eating disorder. It's Always a touch and go situation in those kind of settings. I'm able to provide the care that we all wanted to provide in that school finally. Absolutely. And it's interesting to hear people who have been in practice for years, they very commonly will say like, oh yeah, that's great. But like, you know, some excuse. And I'm like, that's exactly what we all went to medical school for. We didn't go to medical school to be coders, billers, scribes, et cetera. Literally, we went to doctor school to be able to think and to have time with our patients in order to figure things out. Like you're talking about the teenage population in general, but then you have the teenage population and you throw mental health and you throw eating disorders on top of it. There's not going to be successful addressing solution, all the things in one visit every six to 12 months that is 16 minutes long. It's just not going to happen. So I think that this is exactly why DPC is fulfilling because we're able to do the comprehensive care. We're able to say, hey, okay, let's take a second look at things. I get that you're having more questions or your status changed or whatever. We don't have to wait six months to get you in. So I think that's great that you're seeing that in your practice. Now, tell us about the future of Jolly Giant Pediatrics. You dropped a little, some hints already in terms of where you see yourself going in the future. But in terms of the addition of the pediatric therapist, the lactation specialist, what do you see happening in the next three to five years for Jolly Giant Pediatrics in terms of who you're seeing, the patients that you're able to take care of who are not necessarily members, and how you're involved in your community? Yeah, so I'll be honest, five years is very hard for me to think about. There's a lot of things that change in five years. I could maybe give you my three-year plan. (laughs) The objective really right now is, mind you, this is new, right? I don't, and as you said, you see one DPC, you see one DPC. I don't know what my potential limits will be, right? I don't know when I will come to a point where like, let's just say I have 200 or 300 or maybe even 150 members and I'm doing walk-ins and I'm like, when am I capped out? I just don't know. So my goal is to first find that goal. Once I'm there, that's when I'm going to try to find first another like-minded individual to come here and expand the practice, grow, see more patients, take care of the community. While I'm getting to that goal, I also want to be that medical hub. And this might be a 10-year plan down the line, but I would love to have a building just like this one, maybe have a little bit more rooms. And you know what? Yeah, you're going to be able to come into the same building and see your pediatrician, go get physical therapy, have your counselor, and then, you know, maybe speech. And yeah, we'll all be sharing relative space. So parents don't have to go to wherever they have to go and drive for long distances and they can get all of their care under one roof. And you know what? Even if it's not under Jolly Giant Pediatrics, even if it's a different business, it's under one roof. And if there's a collaboration situation, they're just going to walk across the hall or shoot me a text message. I'm not going to have to wait for referral notes from some service or wait two months until someone gets seen because I could walk across the office and be like, hey, Vanessa, like I really need you to see this mom. She's really having trouble with her lactation. Can you squeeze her in? That kind of collaboration that we get spoiled in in academic medicine, I'm, I'm missing it. I'll be honest. So it would be beautiful to have that kind of collaboration and those kind of people within a short distance. And then the other part is, as far as community involvement, I just, I want to be the town doc in the sense, in the old fashioned sense. So I want the school to be able to rely on me to maybe set up educational seminars, maybe do, you know, go to the biology classes and the chemistry classes and talk about medicine and inspire people. 
I just want to be the resource for everyone to utilize my skill set and my passion and, you know, give that to the next generation so they could be happy. And just to give you an example, one thing that did happen is the kids had to reach out to a professional and just figure out some stuff and ask them some questions. And I had a student shoot me an email and I invited them over to come and see the clinic. And we talked about medicine and pediatrics. And, you know, this was an 11th grader just kind of figuring out what they wanted to do in life. But I was able to give that experience to a student that otherwise probably would have never been able to do that because there is nothing around where they live. So that's kind of the goal. How I get there, I have no idea. Figure it out as we get there. And I think that's so real. And that's exactly how it needs to be, right? Because you are adjusting to being in your community. And I think that even as much as you plan out, things happen, like life happens and you have to be able to pivot. But I think that if you are working towards a goal, you can figure out different ways to get to that goal rather than being very rigid and like, this is the only way it can be done. So I think that it is amazing what you brought to the table. And I will say, I'm sure that for the you know parents bringing the strollers in to be able to now in the future, go to one location without having to unload, reload, unload, reload. And like, drop things and cell phones along the way as you're doing it. As parents, you know, you're shaking your head because you know that that's like, that's (laughs) real. Oh my God. But it's amazing what you are doing. And it is amazing what future change you're going to cause in your community because of your presence. So with that, thank you so much for joining us today. No, thank you. I really appreciate everything. And this has been a pleasure to sit and chit chat with you about everything and tell you my story. So it was fantastic talking with Dr. Daniel today. We are going to be talking about the community of DPC pediatricians and physicians in the Austin area and how that community works together to support each other. And we're also going to be talking about more details on the pricing at Jolly Giant Pediatrics. So be sure to join us for this conversation on the Patreon community. Thank you for joining us for another episode of My DPC Story, highlighting the physician experience in the world of direct primary care. I hope you found today's conversation insightful and inspiring. If you want to dive deeper into the direct primary care movement, consider joining our My DPC Story Patreon community. Here, you'll have access to exclusive content, including more interview topics and much more. Don't forget to subscribe to My DPC Story on your podcast feed and follow us on social media as well. If you're able, I'd greatly appreciate if you could leave us a review. It helps others to find the podcast. Until next time, stay informed, stay healthy, and keep advocating for DPC. Read more about DPC News on the daily at dpcnews.com. Until next week, this is Marielle Conception.